Let's try that one again. <laughs> Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, December 2nd. We are picking up in our study of Armageddon. Where we left off is we are talking about the four geographical locations of Armageddon. Last time we were together, two weeks ago, we studied that it happens in four major areas. These areas span almost 200 miles, which just happens to be almost the length of Israel. Had I not uh, been doing a Zoom class, I would have had a map for you, and I should have told you if you have the ability to, to get a map that shows you Israel, you might want it if you're like me and it helps you to see it. But I will try to um, describe the locations as clearly as I can. I think sometimes we get our mindset that it's called Megiddo, or I'm sorry, it's called Armageddon because it's Har Megiddo, the valley uh, or the, the mountain of Megiddo, actually the hill of Megiddo, but it's far more than just there. That's the over, overall name for it. But we'll see as we study these different areas. And as I was starting to say, uh, it covers almost 200 miles, which is almost the full length of Israel, uh, north to south, um, that we're talking about. But uh, just because it has that one name doesn't mean it just happens there. I think also in our limited mind, we think that there's one battle. It starts on one day, and, and when that battle ends, it's over. Well, it, the war is made up of it's a series of battles. We've had the plagues. We've had the trumpets. We've had the bowls. We've come to the conclusion, which is the Battle of Armageddon, but this is a number of battle fronts. Maybe if I put it that way, it will help you understand. So um, the Valley of Megiddo was just the first one. It was also called the Valley of Jezreel, or the Plain of Megiddo. We looked last time at this, Revelation 16, verses 13 to 16, describe it. It's uh, this, this valley is 20 miles long and 14 miles wide. Um, I'm looking for what else I have in description of it. Since I did it last time, I don't have it in front of me. But I think you're all familiar. It's heading toward northern Israel. It's above Jerusalem. Let me put it that way. It's north of Jerusalem for you that the valley of, of Megiddo is. If you hear it called the plain of Esdraelon, that's the Greek form of Jezreel, which is the Hebrew word, again, all speaking of the same area. We also saw that Revelation 9, verses 14 to 19, talk about this battle. We saw it's a huge battle. It sounds very much like tanks are in, uh, involved in this battle. Uh, Daniel 11, verse 44 in particular, is referring to this area. But again, I'm not going into the detail of Megiddo because we talked about it last time. We'll pick up this time with the second location called the Valley of, um, in your English, Jehoshaphat. Okay, we'll read about this in Joel. We're going to be in Joel chapter 2 and 3. We'll start with Joel chapter 2, verse 1 in just a moment. I'll give you time to find it if you want. Let me tell you so that it helps you put it in your mind since we're talking geographic. It is identified with the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley is between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives on the east. It's the valley that goes, you know, comes right through. If you could go as a crow flew from, um, from Jehoshaphat, you would come over to the Mount of Olives. It's the valley in between, okay? So we're closer to Jerusalem than Megiddo. It's another major battle front. We read in chapter 2, verse 1, blow a trumpet in Zion, Zion, or in, in my Hebrew Bible, blow the shofar. Because that's what we're blowing. Blow the shofar in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. You know his holy mountain is Jerusalem, where the Mount Temple Mount is. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Now, as soon as we read day of the Lord is coming, we know we're talking about the end times. We know we're talking about the battle of Armageddon. We know that this is part of the day of the Lord, that the day of the Lord is the whole tribulation period. It technically goes all the way through our millennial kingdom time also. The day of the Lord is coming. Indeed, it is near. It's a day of darkness and of gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it to the years of many generations. So all the way up 
we've got about 4,000 years of history of people, 4,000, close to 6,000 now, history of people, nothing like this battle that's going on, and for generations to come, there'll be nothing like it. When it says that there's a great and mighty people, they're spreading across the, like the dawn spreads across, uh, this or the clouds, this thick darkness, that's an invasion, that's an army, that, or not necessarily army, but a battle that's going on, a um, war that's going on in Scripture. Now notice when it happens, verse 3, it says, A fire consumes before them, behind them a flame devours. So it's like a wildfire that goes through. Before, the land was like the Garden of Eden before them. When they've gone through, it's like a desolate wilderness behind them. Now, that doesn't mean that it happens in the Garden of Eden. It doesn't mean that it happened at the time that we read about the Garden of Eden. It's using that as an example, that it was beautiful before. It was flourishing. It was doing well. When this battle gets through, the, what's left behind is absolute wilderness, absolute desolation, devastation. We know that that is what takes place in the tribulation at the Battle of Armageddon, the culmination um, uh, of when the Lord will return. Nothing's going to escape from them, from this, this army, this invasion that's going on. Um, again, we're going to hear what sounds to me like chair, uh, sorry, tanks. <laughs> I have to use the word for today. Verse 4, their appearance is like the appearance of horses like war horses. So now you've got the battle. The war is what they're looking at. So they run with the noises of chariots. They leap about on the tops of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire consuming the stubble, like a mighty people drawn up for battle. Can you see tanks that are climbing up mountains that are flattening everything in between that are shooting out fire? They're shooting out uh, art, um, artillery. Is that the right word, Roger? Yeah. Okay, shooting out artillery. It sounds to me very much like an invasion of tanks. It could also have horses, you know, um, literally too. We don't know, um, but easily. It's, it's quite a battle that's going on. Versus, uh, verse 5 going on. I read that, didn't I? Yes. Um, verse 7, they run like warriors, climb the wall like soldiers. Each of them marches in line so they don't lose their way. Remember, because there's darkness, there's the cloud, there's... There's all this confusion that's added on to it. Uh, they do not crowd each other. Every warrior that marches in his own path, I just see miles wide an army that's just shoulder to shoulder going and attacking with artillery, with tanks, with all the other that goes along with war. When they burst through the defenses, they do not break ranks. They're winning the battle. They storm the city. Now we're talking Jerusalem probably. Valley of Jehoshaphat, remember Jerusalem's on one side, Mount of Olives on the other side. They run on the wall, they climb into the houses, they enter the windows like a thief. Keep that in mind when we get to Zechariah later, you're going to see a similarity in, in wording there, and I'll explain what I want at that point. Before then the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon become dark, and the stars lose their brightness. We'll talk about all of those events shortly also. We want to look just at the four locations for the moment. The Lord utters his voice before his army. His camp is indeed very great, for mighty is one who carries out his word. So now we've got the Lord coming and his army with him. And it's great and it's awesome. Who can, oh, the day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Uh, so now we know, if, if you're questioning again, the day of the Lord's mentioned again. We know this timing. This is tribulation and this has to be the battle of Armageddon just in another location that is going on also. Yet even now, declares the Lord, even at that moment when the battle is at its fiercest, when these, the armies are invading and, and the city is going down, destruction is everywhere, darkness is all that they're seeing, he even at that moment says, verse 12, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. That doesn't mean take time, you know, you can plan a fast. No, that means don't waste your time even eating. Don't worry about the physical. You need to be in the spiritual. You need to be praying. Pray for your, your protection, for your safety, for the, the battle to be won. Uh, weeping, mourning, because they've ignored their God and, and this devastation has fallen on them for that. Tear your heart, not merely your garments. Don't just show on the outside. Don't be putting on a facade. 
the, let your heart break over these circumstances that you are turning back to the Lord, you are grieved that you have not been right with your God. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious, verse 13, and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in mercy, and relenting of catastrophe. And with that, what do I see? The slow to anger, look how long it took him before he poured out his wrath on this world. It's taken a long time, and we wonder how he can stomach what we're dealing with, and we only know one little portion. I cannot imagine, and how much he has been patient and gracious and full of, of that mercy. But relenting, I see that in the sense that he finally says enough is enough, and he stops it because he said if he didn't stop it, there wouldn't be any flesh left alive for him to, to come back to. So he does stop. He pours out what is rightfully deserved, but he does then bring it back. Um, let's go ahead and go to chapter 3 and look at chapter 3 now. Um, you can read the rest of 2 on your own. It's still talking about the same thing. In chapter 3, verse 2 lets you know it's the same timing and gives us our name again. I will gather all the nations, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So see, the nations are all coming together at Megiddo to battle, but they're also, um, just like an army sends out, you know, different battalions, they're also fighting in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel. Remember, this is the purpose of it. They've come against Israel, and God is now coming against them for coming against Israel. Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. Remember, we looked in Daniel how we believe the Antichrist will divide the land for his gain. That plan is on the table now. They're trying to do that now. They're trying to, to form a Palestinian state out of the state of Israel. Needless to mention, there's 22 Arab countries surrounding Israel. They're not carving out Arab land for the Arab people from any one of those nations. They're wanting to take it out of Israel. This is very biblical. We are not saying it is right because God said, I've given that land. I've given it to the Jews. I can give it to whom I desire. And we know that he's given them even more land than, than the little slice that they have right now. But we know it was prophesied in Daniel 11, uh, I think especially around 40 to 44, somewhere in there, um, that, that he would divide the land for his gain. And here we're reading that they did divide the land for their gain. I believe when they make that division, when they finally do make a two-state solution, I hope and I think it won't be until the tribulation period. I hope I won't live to see it here, but I certainly am seeing the precursor of it. But when they do it in the, quote, for peace, I think that there's ulterior motive behind it. The same way that the Antichrist is going to tell them, the Jewish people, build your temple. I'll give you that freedom of worship. Yet we know that he knows he's going to take it and usurp it for himself. He's just letting them build it, letting them spend their money, letting them fix it up, lulling them into the false peace, and then, boom, down comes the, the real uh, purpose behind those judgments. They've cast lots for my people. That means that they've gambled for them, bet on, on them, the ones that, that are going to lose here. And then it goes on, let's drop down, let's go down to verse 9. Verse 9 says, Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for holy war, stir up the warriors, have all the soldiers come forward, have them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Later we're going to find out they won't do that anymore, that they, they will put down these implements of war and pick up what is in, in uh, peace. I think it's Ze Zephaniah 2... 4 or 14. We'll look it up in just a moment. I don't want to lose my place here. Remind me if I forget. Um, let the weak man Bridget, say... Yes. Bridget, what are you reading? This is Maria. I'm sorry. Maria. What, I'm, I'm I, sorry. I got disconnected, so I lost it. Oh, so. <laughs> bless your heart. We are in Joel chapter 3. Uh, I just read 9 and, and 10. If you were lost for a little bit, we probably covered Joel 2, verses 1 through 11 while you were gone. And then, yeah. we went, okay, and then we went to chapter 3. I read verse okay. 2, I think I read 2 and 3, and now I'm dropping down to 9. And I'm going to read 9 through 16. Okay, thank okay. you. You're welcome. Thank you for getting my attention. 
Um, I actually have read nine and ten. Um, the, yeah, the weak becoming, saying I'm a warrior. Verse 11, hurry and come, all you surrounding nations. Is this not tribulation talk? All the nations of the world converging on Israel. Gather yourselves there. Bring down, Lord, your warriors. The Lord's going to come with his warriors also at that end to do battle. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. So we know when God brings judgment against all the nations, it is the battle of Armageddon. It is the culmination of the tribulation. This fits perfectly with what's being said. Um, and besides being called the day of the Lord, it's also in the valley of Jehoshaphat, which I've already shown you. It's one of the locations of the battle of Armageddon. Now, verse 13 is key to Revelation 14. Maybe on the way over to Revelation, we'll stop off in Zephaniah real quick. Uh, but right now, verse 13 of Joel 3 says, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread the grapes, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Symbolic language, we're not going into a literal wine vat, but Israel had wine vats. Israel knew what a wine vat looked like, and they were accustomed to the trampling of the grapes. And when you trample the grapes, the, the, the juice will squirt out. We're going to see that being symbolic of blood that is squirting out. We'll be talking about that shortly. But that's what is going on here. Let me show you that in Revelation 14 also. But at the same time, like I say, let's run over. Okay. I thought I had this set up. Here we go. Let's run over to Zeph Zephaniah. What did I say? Four or did I say two? Uh, I'll tell you in a moment. I'm trying to get there fast. Um, okay, it's not 2-4. Is it 4-2? <laughs> I didn't know I was going to go to it, or I would have looked it up before, but I'm trying to move cobwebs around in my hand. Okay, it's not Zephaniah 4. Let me see if I can find it. Hard copy Michelle, real fast. Yes. Said, Rochelle, before you said uh, Zephaniah 2-4. Okay, I was wrong on that, so I'm standing corrected. Thank you for that, but... Um, what I want is where they beat their um, plows into, beat the Pop beat the swords into plowshares. <laughs> it's the opposite of what we just read. Maybe it's Zechariah, because I'm not finding it in Zephaniah, and I know about where it is on the page. If I can't find it quick, I'll look it up for you later. It's a famous verse. Um, my mom even had it on a map, which I know right where it is in the old house. <laughs> I could go read it. But... Uh, I'm not finding it quickly, and I don't want to prolong it. I probably could find it if I wasn't under tension. Um, but I don't see it in either, so I'll find it for you later. But it was like the exact opposite of what we read in Joel, where they're, they're making the implements for war. They're going to be making implements for peace, the exact opposite that's coming in the millennium. It might even come up in my scriptures in the millennial kingdom. Isaiah but 2 -4. Who? Isaiah 2-4. Isaiah? Yeah. Uh-uh. I'll look up Isaiah 2 4. It might be similar, but I know what I want is one of the either Zephaniah or, or Zechariah. Uh, but I'll look up Isaiah 2 4 real quickly, and I thank you for trying, Roger. Uh, and I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm saying for what I want. Right. Okay, maybe I'm going to stand really corrected and say that is what I want. Thank you. <laughs> I never would have found it. Okay, it's Isaiah 2-4. Had the right reference, but the wrong address. The wrong... <laughs> this is why we need to know numbers and names of books, because it's like going to a, a home address. You won't get there if you don't know the number of the house and the name of the street. <laughs> Isaiah 2-4, he shall judge among the nations. He shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Doesn't that sound like the exact opposite of Joel? That's what's coming. God has a victory, and that's what's coming when there won't be war anymore in the millennial kingdom. Can you imagine a thousand years on the face of the entire earth that there's shalom, that there's peace? This world has never known that. Never. On the whole face of the earth, continual peace. Wow, that will be the Garden of Eden again. <laughs> <laughs> but now, staying with what Joel was saying, 
running over to Revelation 14, remember I like to show you it's not just one that is saying it. We let scripture back up, up scripture and we get a fuller picture when we get it from different angles also. So when we're talking about the wine press, when we're talking about uh, the trampling that we were just reading, keep that in mind while we go to Revelation 14 and start with verse um, 14. Here is where we know it's the Lord in return. It says, I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now there's controversy over whether this is the Son of Man, Yeshua himself, or an angel doing his duty. We won't get into that at this point here, <clears throat> but this is coming out of heaven. This is not earthly, it's not man doing it. This is at the hand or direction of the Lord. Another angel came out of the temple, calling out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now here's why I think it is the Lord, because it says, Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. So I think it's the Lord who is doing that reaping. I think that it's not, uh, it's not that this angel was directing the Lord and telling the Lord what to do any more than we are telling the Lord what to do when we say even so come quickly Lord Jesus or you know defend them Lord you know fight the battle win the battle uh, any of that that is the same spirit I see as this angel turning to the Lord and in essence just saying it's time do it Lord bring it on you know it, it's his cheering squad not one that's directing him but one that, that that's caught up in the moment with him and it, I believe is the Lord who is reaping uh, the, with the sickle over the earth but the, again it's giving us that picture um, reaping we're going to see he's going to, to um, trample also we're, we're going to see the two come together give me a moment we'll get there I need to keep reading another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven so we know it's heavenly warfare coming he also had a sharp sickle then another angel the one who has power over fire came out from the altar. He called out with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp, sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. Now it sounds like Joel. The grapes again. The grapes are ripe. And remember, that's ripe. They're ready to burst. They're almost overripe when we get into the original language. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth, gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside of the city, that would be the city of Jerusalem. The blood came out from the winepress up to the horses' bridles. The picture of grapes being stomped and all this juice coming up is a picture now of the blood that is coming up from this great sickle that is reaping, that has harvested the earth, that is killing off these enemies of Israel. And the blood is so high that it says, in this one, it says a distance of 600 stadia. If you take that into vernacular, we understand today that's approximately 200 miles. Do you remember how long I told you from north to south our four locations cover? Almost 200 miles. Wasn't that four feet deep? And that's something like four feet deep, yes. Because, you know, you've got to get up to the horse's bridle. So it might be even closer to five feet because I picture a horse about right here on me and I'm a little more than five feet. So it's, it's a huge slaughter. And the only way they can, can picture it is by, by this wine press. So the wine press is the Lord's wine press. But this is horrible, horrible devastation. Remember when we studied Armageddon earlier, we studied how many were killed, that the bodies just laid and they had to be, uh, the birds had to come eat off the flesh quickly for the sake of uh, health issues. And then the bones had to be buried and it, it's taking them seven months to bury the bones. Mm. You know, it... If you catch, just for a moment, COVID in the beginning, when they were saying the morgues couldn't keep up with it in New York, and they brought in refrigerator trucks, and there were just so many people there. Go to this, this um, horror in Ethiopia that just happened, where they slaughtered village, uh, or villages, I probably should say, uh, farmers, of uh, their wives, of their children. And, and all they could do was this mass grave. They had a huge grave. It made me think of World War II and the scenes that I've seen that I wish I had never seen. 
That's nothing compared to 200 miles of this. This is a horrible, horrible devastation. This is the height of the tribulation. This is the height of the wrath of God come against the enemies of our Lord, our Messiah, Yeshua. This is quite an invasion, and this sounds again like Joel. So let's go back to Joel, because I know we're talking about the same thing in both of these uh, chapters. We are talking about that same battle, part of it taking place in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh, we're picking up at verse 15. I think we, yeah, we, well, 14 says, Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the Valley of Decision. Some call this area where, where people are making up their minds which side they're going to be on. And they, they say that when they're um, troubled with something today. Don't stay in the Valley of Undecision. Get into the Valley of Decision with the Lord and get on the Lord's side. Verse 15, the sun and the moon have become dark. The stars have lost their brightness. Again, we'll touch on that more in the future. Um, but let me go ahead and read you now because then it'll be familiar. We're going to get to it today. But it's still, um, the more we hear over and over, at least for me, the better I retain it. So does this not sound like Revelation 6, verses 12 and 13? You might just keep a hand in Revelation as well. Um, we're going back a little bit, I think, to Joel. We're almost done with Joel. Anyway, Revelation 6, 12, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. Remember, we read about the earth shaking. The sun became as black as sackcloth made of hair. The whole moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig, drop, fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. I get that today. we got a great wind outside my house, and it's knocking everything off. <laughs> uh, the sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. That is world devastation, earthly devastation, heavenly devastation, all of this tying in with Joel and with Revelation 14, where we were reading earlier. Um, let's go back real quick to Joel. I want to point out, I'm not sure I did in verse 9. We've already read it. But verse 9, maybe I didn't read it. It says, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for holy war. Stir up the warriors. I did read it. Have all the soldiers come forward. Have them come out. This is saying that they're to prepare for war. Uh, since World War II, the largest world trade uh, in commerce has been for armaments, for our weapons of war. Today we're in an armament race, and it's believed he who has the most wins. That's why even with nuclear, they're looking for who has the most bombs, who has the most nuclear uh, activity. The, the, um, there's a word. There's a word. We're talking about it with Iran right now, that Israel will not let Iran get its nuclear... Arsenal. No, but brought up to a certain standard. What's it called? Um, oh. Um, I know the word so well. Centrifuges. Centrifuges. The, the centrifuges. But it's there's nuclear capability that can be used for the good for people. Then there's a level, and that's the level of the word I'm trying to get atomic. that that will come back to me. Atomic? Um. No. Well, <clears throat> atomic fits it. That's the, the area that's a danger. That's where they're using it. They don't need that much for the good for the people. That's when they're using it for, for warfare. And that's what they're talking about here also, is that it, it's being uh, prepared for war. It's being brought up to that higher level. And the idea is, if, if you've got that capability, you can, you'd be the one that caused the most damage. So Iran being as close as they are to Israel, Israel can't let Iran get to that point. That's your newspaper today. If you wonder why what just happened in Iran, taking out the, the person that was taken out, it is because it has to be slowed down. It's not the time. We're not seven years into the tribulation. And if Iran got to that stage to be able to devastate Israel, where she would wipe Israel off the face of the map, God's not allowing that. So I'm not saying who is responsible. That's not for me to say. You can draw your own conclusion. That's all I will say. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just turn on the news. If this isn't very fitting, if we do not see everything building up and, and coming together, all the puzzle pieces of the nations around falling into place in relation to the battle, then I don't know. Then my name isn't Michelle. I'll put it that way. Um, and yet this is seven years off. But remember, we're going to have a false peace come in to calm things down. And then the reality of what really is going on and the build up to the crescendo where the Lord takes it all out. Hallelujah. Israel, you don't need to worry. I read the final chapter. 
and you win. You win because Messiah is coming to his land that he put his name on, that he has chosen, that he said will never come to an end. Hallelujah. Back on track, off my soapbox. We have looked at the Valley of Jehoshaphat. We have looked at Armageddon itself. Now I'm going to take you to Edom, E-D-O-M. Edom is the third major location for the battlefront for the Battle of Armageddon. I hope my words are clear and understandable. Edom is southeast of Jerusalem. It's south of the Dead Sea. It goes all the way to the Gulf of Aqaba, which is um, Elot, the Red Sea. Elot belongs to Israel. Gulf of Aqaba comes, comes right in there to Elot. So it's going, if this is Israel, it's going like this. And it takes in even the area that we know Petra is in. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to give you all these technical names, but let me, let me include this because you'll find this on your map easily. Uh, the, the area that Petra is in is a basin that's surrounded by mountains. Those mountains form the eastern flank of the Arava Valley. Valley or the Arba in English, A-R-A-B-A-H, B as in boy, that valley, that runs from the Dead Sea all the way down to the Gulf of Aqaba. When you're in Israel, if you've been with us on, on tours, they talk about when you're in that basin. If you can see a relief map um, of, of Israel and the surrounding areas, you'll see the valleys and the basins and the mountains this is the one that when you're looking down, it's a huge basin down here, okay? Um, now, where do we see Edom in Scripture? How do we tie that into the Battle of Armageddon? Very easily. Start with Isaiah this time. Yeshia, go to Isaiah 34. And Isaiah 34, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> Come near, you nations, to hear. Listen, you peoples. Let the earth and all it contains hear, and the world and all that springs from it. For the Lord's anger is against all the nations, his wrath against all their armies. When else is that but tribulation? That's the only time we read that the Lord's anger is coming against. His wrath is being poured out against all the nations, against all of their armies. Verse 2 continuing, he has utterly destroyed them. He has turned them over to slaughter. So their slain will be thrown out, their corpses will give off their stench, the mountains will be drenched with their blood. Does that sound what we just, like what we just read in Revelation? Does it sound like the, 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 um, the blood up to the horse's bridle? All of that, everything, we see that we're talking the same language, that this is the same time it is relevant because of that. Um, verse 4, all the heavenly lights will wear away. Well, didn't we read about the sun, the moon, and the stars? And we will continue to. When we tie up our fourth location very shortly here, then we will read about the signs in the heavens, and I'll give you all those references, or a lot of them anyway, for the sun, the moon, and the stars. It's the lights will also wither away as a leaf withers from the vine, or as one withers from the fig tree. For my sword is drunk, it's filled in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment. Remember the angel with the sword, with the sickle, reaping on the earth? Uh, it will, behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom. Here's our area, upon Edom. Upon the people whom I've designated for destruction. Remember, he said he would destroy the enemies of Israel on the mountains of Israel. Uh, uh, verse 6. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It drips with fat with the blood of lambs and goats with the fat of the kidneys of rams. That doesn't mean literally these animals. It's talking about the whole war scene as if there was a great sacrifice of animals. Now notice where it says here, for the Lord has a sacrifice in Bozrah. Bozrah on your map is just below the Dead Sea. So we know we're talking about this Arava Valley. We know that we're talking about this whole area. Edom is not a city. It's a region. That's what I'm trying to get across. Bozrah is in Edom. Okay, wild oxen also will fall with them and young bulls with strong ones so the land will be soaked with blood. Their dust become greasy with fat. Here's your key if you doubt my words. For the Lord has a day of vengeance. A year of retribution for the cause of Zion. 
Zion. That doesn't mean a literal year and a literal day. It's talking about a time. And it does indicate, as battles do, it's not that it's going to start and stop in an hour. Battle goes on. It's, it's day in and day out for, for a bit of time. Um, let's see, how far did I want to read down in, um, in here? I think that's where I'm going to stop with verse 8. You can read on on your own. Go with me to chapter 63 of Isaiah. 63. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6. 63.1. Who is this who comes from Edom? <clears throat> so you know I'm talking the same area. With garments of glowing colors from Bozrah. Remember Bozrah, the city south of the Dead Sea in the region of Edom. This one who is majestic in his apparel marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I, the one who speaks in righteousness, mighty to save. Who is that? That is the Lord and he alone. He is the only one who ever speaks in righteousness, who is mighty to save, who is majestic in his apparel. Yet, verse 2, why is your apparel red? Your garments like one who treads in the winepress. Remember we saw the symbolism of the winepress. And here's his answer. I have trodden the wine trough alone, or the wine press alone. And from the peoples, there was no one with me. I also trod them in my anger, and trampled them, and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments. I have stained all of my clothes, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. What are we reading? We are reading that, that the Lord himself does this battle. He is the one who has slain the enemies where their blood has been spread, sprinkled on his garment so that he is seen as if one who has been in the wine press trampling the grapes because it's the day of his vengeance. Remember, his cup of wrath came full. His cup of wrath, finally, his holiness had to mete out justice. And that's what is happening. No one was there to help him. He did it. He himself. Um, so my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath upheld me. He was victorious. No one helped him. He was victorious himself. Um, let's go ahead and read verse 6. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk with my, with my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. It was as if they were, they were drunk. And what were they drunk on? The blood of the people they had killed, the blood of the Jewish people and the believers that they had gone after, that they had been slain when he put his stop to them and let it be their lifeblood that's now poured out on the earth. Wow, what a, a horrendous thing to see, what a majestic and mighty God to do battle, but woe to the earth and its inhabitants. Does that wine press sound like the same one we read about in Revelation 14, verses 15 to 19? I think so. And we'll see that come in again. Um, in fact, let's go ahead, let's run back to Revelation 14, although maybe I don't need to. I think I can just remind you since we read it, you, you're looking again at verses 14 to 20. And it talks about that river of blood that's nearly 200 miles long. When you m measure from Megiddo in the north to a lot on the, the southern tip of the Red Sea, that is 182 miles. A furlong is about 600 miles, so if you're, or 600 feet, I'm sorry, so if you're dealing with furlongs, it still comes out, whatever your version is reading, it still comes out to be about 182 miles, or we round it off when we say nearly 200 miles. So it fits perfectly that Megiddo is the most northern point of the Battle of Armageddon, and it goes all the way down to a lot in the Valley of Edom, that uh, we're to, to cover this 200 mile range. Let's look one more time, maybe we haven't done it yet, at Revelation 19. This is a better chapter. How do you say that? Scripture doesn't have better or lesser chapters. This is a chapter with victory, <laughs> okay? Revelation 19 has the return of the Lord. That's what I'm trying to say. That's where the hallelujah comes in, okay? We're in such a horrible scene. I've got to give you the upside of it. Verse 13 tells us, He, the Lord, is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So see, I'm not saying it. I'm telling you. I'm reading it right out of Scripture. That's who he is, the one who is called the Word of God. Um, then let's read down verse 15, because verse 14 talks about we who come with him. Uh, and we'll get into that again when we get to the end. But 
stay with just him in verse 15. The Lord, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Remember, the word of God is like a sharp two-edged sword, and it pierces, even cuts between bone and marrow. It, it, it just, you know, so splices so finely. Uh, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that he may strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. We know that's what takes place in the millennium, and hallelujah it does, because then there is no war, and there is no injustice being done. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. So he is trampling the winepress. The, the winepress belongs to God. It is the Lord doing the will of the Father, the Son carrying out the will of the Father. Remember the Father told him to wait till I make your enemies your footstool. Well, he brought them all into converge in this one area, 200 miles long. It, the Lord's got a huge foot. But that foot's coming down on that 200 miles, and it is squishing it as if it was just a wine press full of grapes. That's like from here to Vegas. From here to Vegas, okay. That's 222 miles. Okay, right? so just a little shorter from than from San Bernardino to Las Vegas. Wow. That's a huge spread. That's a mighty big footprint. But when God puts his foot down, he has the final word. Just be thankful you and I are not under that foot. We're not the enemies being made his footstool. We are the army coming back with him to rule and reign because we have already been given our robes of righteousness and justified in his holy name. That's um, exciting. Yes, it is exciting. Um, I'm going to, excuse me, I, my assistant had to leave for a moment and Rowena's trying to get in and I want to get her in before she gives up. Can I open it? Go up. Whoops. Go up. Go up. Go up. Go. Oh, no, no, no. Go down. You can see I'm not good with a pad. Come on. Oh, come on. Over. Oh, there we go. Yay. <laughs> Thank the Lord for small miracles. Rochelle worked Roger's computer and got Rowena in. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We prayed you in, Rowena. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Uh, we're picking up at our last location for the Battle of Armageddon. It was four geographic locations. We talked about Megiddo in the north. We talked about Jehoshaphat that is below um, Jerusalem. We talked about going all the way down to Edom, all the way down south. Now I'm going to bring you back up to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, because yes, it's in the Battle of Jerusalem also in the battle of, in the city of Jerusalem also. I'm sorry, my mind is spinning faster than my words can speak. Um, I got uh, Rowena in, Roger. Mm, good. Okay, we are going to Zechariah. We're going to Zechariah chapter 12, and we'll be reading verses, well, read on your own from 1 to 11 for the whole thought, but I'm going to pick up just a few of the verses. I'm going to speak, pick up verse 2, uh, because we're looking at my point being that the battle now is in Jerusalem also. Verse 2, Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes staggering to all the peoples around when the siege is against Jerusalem. Because we hear that. We hear that Jerusalem's going to be a stumbling stone, and we know it already is. But it's never been fulfilled as greatly as it will be then. And we know that the Lord is even saying here, when the siege is against Jerusalem, when they're coming against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah, against more than just the city of Jerusalem. It will come about on that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will injure themselves severely. All the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. So we know this is literal. It does come right up against Jerusalem also. And any who try to... to take a piece of Jerusalem for themselves are going to find it a heavy stone. They're going to find that they've hurt themselves by it, by trying to come against it. Um, Roger, you might close the windows a bit because the wind's getting noisier. Please. <laughs> um, I hope you heard that. Verse 4, on that day declares the Lord. Do I want to read verse 4 now? I won't read it now. That goes on and tells you about the battle. That's what I'm telling you to read on your own. But right now, I just want you to keep your focus that it's happening in Jerusalem, literally. Drop down to verse 8. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You might need to close windows. It's starting to get pretty wild, Roger. 
especially over here, okay. the noise, I'm afraid. Thank you. Okay. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them on that day will be like David. The house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. So what was David like? <laughs> I love it. Was David big Superman, mighty hero? Name all those cartoon characters that they've been having in movies that fight each other to say who's top dog in the cartoon world. Well, was that what David looked like? Nope. Who was David? Thank you, Roger. David was a little shepherd boy. David was small. He was ready in appearance. He wasn't even looked at like someone that you would expect to be a king, to be a leader of your country. You know, you want someone that, that's got that regal pose and that's big and foreboding. And Samuel, when he went to anoint the one who was going to be king, went through all of David's brothers before God it, God said, no, nope, not this one, not this one, not this one. Jesse, the, the father of David, brought out all his sons that were big and strong and looked like they could be the king. Nope. Samuel the prophet. Nope. Nope. Do you have any others? Well, I've got this little boy out in the shepherd field, but he's just a little shepherd boy. And the shepherds were looked down on. They were not the kingly position of, of um, occupation. They were the lowly occupation. And, of course, when David's brought in, God says, this is the one who'll be king. He picked a little that he might get the glory. Then that little shepherd boy, in his, in his petiteness, <laughs> I can't think of another word, goes to see how his brothers are doing because they are battling. They're in the battle against the enemy, against the Philistines. Oi, who? I want to stomp them out like we stomp out Haman, uh, Hamon in uh, our book of Esther at, at uh, Purim time. Anyway, there's Goliath. Now, Goliath, is who you think would be a king. Nine feet, six inches, they think. Some say he has six fingers and six toes on each hand and each foot. Big, big voice. Causes the people to scare, to, 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 to shake with fright, to run and hide when he comes out. And here comes little David. The audacity. Little mouse. Big elephant. But David had a secret weapon. He knew his God, and he knew the power of his God. And he said, in my time shepherding, which whatever we're doing, God's preparing us for our future. In my time shepherding, the lions came. I took them out. The bears came. I took them out. How did he take them out? In the power of the Lord. All he had was another bigger bear standing before him. I can take this one out. Well, no one else willing. So, of course, they let little David do it, but Saul wants to help David. So Saul puts on him all of his armor. <laughs> it had to be quite a scene. I've got one putting armor on the other one here right now behind me. My bigger kitty with my little kitty. But it had to be funny because here comes David. He can't even walk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what a job. I know that. If I put on my, my father's clothes, you know, the sleeves are past the, the hands and they would drag you. And, and they'd be so heavy. David said, I don't need that. I've got the Lord. And he goes out and he picks up the stones from the brook. And he takes a stone, and with one little stone, he rocks the giant to sleep in the power of the Lord. Because when he flew into his, his battle, he said, he comes against Goliath in the name of the Lord. That's the same name that the Maccabees used when they came against the enemy. And we have Hanukkah in another week to celebrate the victory of little Israel against the big Syrian army. This is what we are seeing on that day. The little ones, the ones that are insignificant, the ones that, that aren't full of power of themselves and realize that. So they're relying on their God for rescuing. The feeble ones, they will be like David. They'll be like David in the house of the Lord and David was like God not he was God but the power of God on him and the angel of the Lord has the victory that's what we're seeing 
It's not that Israel finally musters up enough, gets together enough, is good enough, strong enough, the others have been weakened enough. No, Israel is devastated. We're going to see just how bad uh, Jerusalem is when we turn to the next two chapters in Zechariah. It is not anything that man does on their own. The Lord, he is victor, and his victory is all over the mountains of Israel. His victory is all over 182 miles spread. His victory is from Megiddo in the north to a lot in the south and centers in the place, the city he's chosen to put his name on, where he will put up his holy throne, and he will be worshipped. Hallelujah. I can hardly wait to see it. To see that temple worship to the one true and living God of Israel sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, cometh Israel. What a statement I just said. Hallelujah. Zechariah 13. Because we're not quite there yet, but we've got to know the final chapter. I love reading the end before we go through the horrors. Makes it easier to read through the horrors. Zechariah 13 verses 8 and 9. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish. That's two-thirds of the land. The third will be left in it. Verse 9, I will bring the third part through the fire. Refine them as silver is refined. Test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. What a beautiful end. But look at the beginning. Two-thirds of this city is going to be devastated. Two-thirds is going to perish. That, that's it. Two out of three are going to be cut off. Two out of three are going to die. That's horrible. But that third part, that's the Lord's remnant. That third part are those who are looking to the Lord, those who are believers on Him. He will bring them through that fire. And the fire for them is what the fire does, what the kiln does now. When we put the fine china in the kiln, it's to get rid of the dross and to bring out the beauty. They will be refined through that fire. They'll be tested and come out like gold. And it's because they call on His name and He answers them. They are His people. He is their Lord. He is their God, and the victory is His. Chapter 14 tells us more about this battle against Jerusalem. It says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoils taken from you will be divided among you. Verse 2, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. Notice who's doing it. Let me make it very clear. We are not victims in this world. When we talk about how we're victims of COVID right now, we are not victims of COVID. We are in the hands of the Lord. The circumstances do not look good. The circumstances are hard. They're devastating and disparaging to us. But notice, the Lord is using it. The Lord is at work. The Lord is going to bring all these enemies against Jerusalem to battle to slay them all in that one swift move with the sword that comes out of his mouth. He has a purpose in it. We get confined in our mind and we look at the little detail of one little, and we think we know the whole picture. And are we not doing that in COVID? We are thinking that this is, and, and believe me, it is devastating that people are losing their lives. I don't take that lightly. But we are not victims of it that, that the Lord is up there pacing and has lost control. He is even using it. Do you know there are people getting saved during this time because of it? If you have to, to see someone lose all of their worldly goods to find out the treasure in heaven is where the treasure needs to be, to have an eternal home, then you know what? It's worth everything they go through here on this earth to gain their eternal salvation in heaven. God is in control. He is working it. Don't look at the disparaging. Look at your God. Look at him and see. He's going to allow the nations to come to do battle against Jerusalem. The city will be taken. The houses will be plundered. The women will be raped. Half of the city is exiled. The rest of the people will not be eliminated from the city. So right up front, at this point, we've already got half of Jerusalem cut off. This is horrible. I've been in Jerusalem. I had that free week in Jerusalem. I saw those faces all over. And I thought if we are as close to the tribulation as I feel that we are, oh, Lord God, I plead for these people. 
I plead for their eyes to be opened, the blindness to be removed, that they would escape this coming horrible time. But when it is this bad, when half of the city goes off in exile, and the women are raped, and the houses are plundered, and all that I just read, then, verse 3, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. And we've been reading that day of battle where he's fighting. On that day, when he comes to do battle against all the enemies that have converged now in Jerusalem against Jerusalem, that's the day when his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Remember where the first valley we talked about was? The valley um, of, uh, uh, what did we call it? <laughs> Let me look at my notes. Again, my mind is spinning too fast. Um, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, um, between the Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives in the Kidron Valley. Remember, we talked about it. Now we're in Jerusalem also. The battle's been up north. The battle's been down south. The battle's been in the valley right there. And the battle is on the height of Jerusalem, the city also. And that is where the Lord's feet return. Remember, he left from Jerusalem and he said he would come back. And he comes back. He puts his feet. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west, forming a very large valley. So he pushes out east to west. Now he makes a new valley, really. Half the mountain moved toward the north, half the mountain toward the south. So I should be going like this with my hands. And then this is what's coming out that is huge. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. And it goes on and it tells about this this. Um, battle that's going on, the earthquake, all that, everything sounds exactly like what we've been reading about for the battle of Armageddon. So here we see from Zechariah, we see that two-thirds of Israel is cut off, and then we see a half again of the city of Jerusalem is cut off. The numbers are coming down to just the few. Remember his words, if I didn't come and stop the battle now, there'd be no flesh left alive. This is nothing to take lightly. This is something to realize the horrors of war and to see that blood spread so far and so wide and so high. We realize how many people will be slain in this battle. We need to pray for the salvation of Israel. Now we've got it from Megiddo to Bozrah, south of the Dead Sea. We've got it all the way down to a lot. Uh, we have Armageddon going from basically... I'd say the Valley of Megiddo, you see the Galilee to the north of it. So from the, the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee all the way down to the, the bottom southern border of, um, of Israel where Elat is, almost down where Egypt is. You can see it all from that area. So about the only area that we're not talking about is north of Galilee, Galilee and north of it, that does not seem to have this blood spread over it. It's um, more than two-thirds of Israel more than two-thirds of Israel, um, Israel as she is on the map today. So again, a horrible, horrible time of battle. It is all the nations coming against Jerusalem. They want her. They want the spoils of war. They want, remember it said that at first she was flourishing and then she wasn't. There's going to be, and we talked about the value of different uh, things that are found in Israel that they're going to be after. But to tie up our, our um, notes on Armageddon, Let's look just very quickly at those signs in the heaven. Remember when you see all of this and you hear all of this, it's taking place simultaneously in all of these places. They're going to see the signs in the heaven at the same time that all of this is happening at these four battle locations. Why do I stress that? Because we hear of a battle here and a battle there. We hear about this and we hear about that. And some want to say, is this Armageddon? Is this Armageddon? Well, number one, we know it's the wrong time. We even saw Ezekiel 38 and 39 that when this battle happens, the world will know he is the Lord. And it says it over and over again in those chapters. Then they will know I am the Lord. Then they will know I am the Lord. Our world does not know he is the Lord right now. They are flat, flat flailing this in the, the eyes of our God. They are calling themselves God, and they are doing their own thing, and they are not knowing that he is the Lord God. But by the time the tribulation events have happened worldwide, and the tribulation starts with Jerusalem, it starts, it's centered there, but it goes out over the whole face of the earth. By the time you get through all of the bowls and the trumpets and the seals, all of that, and you culminate in this battle, you have so many dead. 
but out of the ones who are left alive, the ones who will see the Lord return on to the mountains of Israel, to the Mount of Olives, are the ones who say, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The ones who are faithful to the Lord that he's bringing through those fires, bringing through the tribulation, both Jewish and Gentile believers in the Lord are the remnant. They are the ones who will see and who God will protect there in the end, that there be some left alive that he's come back to. And then he will cleanse the land, replenish, refill, repopulate, will go on. That's our next study, because we'll get out of the yuck and into the glory, and it will be wonderful. We deserve it and need it after trampling through the horrors of battle. It, it just, I don't want us to be complacent in our understanding of it, because if you realize how devastating, how bad, how worldwide, you want to tell people how to escape. You want to get out and witness. You want to get out and share. And I'm encouraging you. Yes, you can't physically right now, but you certainly can in every other way. There is still the, the snail mail. There is still social media. There is still Zoom. There is still telephones and cell phones and all kinds of ways to have conversations and to share. So ask for opportunity if you don't know how to find it. Ask for opportunity because we want to help as many people as possible escape the horrors of this time. As if it's not bad enough on the earth and all this happening on the earth, let me take you rapidly, and especially because there's one point I want to in particular uh, bring out to you. Let me take you rapidly through the signs in the heavens during and at the end of the tribulation just before Messiah returns. We've talked about some of them today, some of them previous days, and maybe we a new verse or two. But let me just give you several right now quickly. Isaiah 30 and verse 26 will be the first one we look at. Isaiah 30 and verse 26. And the light of the full moon will be like the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven days. On the day the Lord binds up the fracture of his people and heals the wound he has inflicted. So we have, during this time, the sun's going to get even hotter. We know the sun's going to scorch them, that the sun's going to be burning them because it's seven times brighter and hotter than it is now. We know that God put this planet Earth, called the third rock from the sun, at just the right location so that we don't freeze and we don't burn. Now, yeah, we say when we're cold, we're freezing, and we say that we're burning when we are out in the sun and we do get a sunburn, but not like what will be happening at this time. And even the moon will be so much more brighter. It'll be like the sun. Then the sun will be like it's on steroids, and it'll be seven times brighter than it is now. And in that, we have the period of time where it talks about the, um, the, they'll be scorched, and they won't be able to get away from it. Joel 2, I know we looked at this, but let's... Again, just put it all together. Joel chapter 2, and we'll look at verses uh, 30 through 32. <clears throat> we read earlier, now we're going to just tie it up with this thought here from Joel. Also, I will display, and this is God speaking, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth. We've been talking about the earth. Blood, fire, columns of smoke, that's on the earth. Now, the sun will be turned into darkness. It's like the sun burned itself out, went on on steroids and then burnt itself out. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood. I think the moon is reflecting the blood of the earth and the sun and it's dark and it allows the moon to show itself to be blood red. We've had the red blood moons, but nothing like this will look like them. Again, the worst has ever been. When does this happen, the moon turn into blood? Before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That doesn't mean before this all starts. That means before that that day that he returns in that battle of Armageddon. It will come about that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved from on Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, just as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. I read verse 32 just for the encouragement. There will be those saved. Hallelujah. God always has a remnant. 
Matthew 24. You know that I tell you, take this chapter in order, 24, and even into 25, and you have the layout of the tribulation and times according to the Jewish plan, because remember, they were Jewish boys asking a Jewish question to their Jewish rabbi who was telling them about the plan for Israel. It has nothing to do with the church. You can't put the church into Matthew 24. You've got to keep the plan with Israel. As soon as you put the church in there, you get yourself into a whole mess of trouble. Believe me. <laughs> right now we're going to look at 24 and verse 29. Um, verse 27 has told us that the lightning, that the Son of Man is returning. That's verse um, a little before. I'm looking real fast. A little before um, you're being told in Matthew 24 that the Lord is returning. And that when he does return, it'll be lightning from the east to the west. So is the coming of the Son of Man be. That's verse 27. When he comes in second coming, not to be confused with rapture. This is totally different. This is when his feet come all the way down to the earth to the Mount of Olives. When he comes like then, the whole earth is going to see. You see lightning all the way across the sky. That's how he's going to be seen. Everyone's going to see it. Rapture is totally different. It's not the description given for the rapture at all. We've talked about it other times. That's all I'll say right now. But if you have issue or need for more information, scripture to back up scripture, let me know and I'll get it to you. Verse 28, again we know from this is Armageddon time because it says wherever the course is, there the vultures will gather. Remember that great, this, the supper of the great God? It's a huge supper. The, all these vultures, all these scavenger birds that eat flesh, <clears throat> God sends them all in to clean up the fish, flesh rapidly because it's too much. It's got to be done so that, that the bones can be buried. But the flesh, if it was left that long, look what happens in a tsunami. Look what happens in a war. If they leave those bodies out any length of time at all, the, the stench and then the sicknesses that come with it, that's what God is preventing there. So these things are happening, we know, in relation to the Battle of Armageddon. We've been just talking about that and all the scriptures we've gone through back it up. So verse 29, it says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, Right there in our English, some people trip. Okay, wait a minute. After all those things happen, then the sun's darkened and the moon won't give us light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. But Rochelle, you were just telling us all that happens at the Battle of Armageddon. How come this is but immediately after? Because we're trying to translate from another language into English and we're not understanding what is being said here. The idea of this is it means that there are immediate consequential events that happen in the sky upon at, at the time of the tribulation it, it's consequences you can't have one without the other while all of this is happening on the earth the consequences are seen in the sky the consequences of what happens in the sky are falling on the earth so it's a relation it's a consequential interaction it's not that there's a distance of time it's not that you can <laughs> Sorry, folks, I've got someone selling. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but then he took off, so I don't know. Just pray for him. <laughs> anyway, this is the interesting side of Zoom, <laughs> okay? So what I'm trying to say to you is there isn't a time that we can say A, B, C, D. Is that they're interacting upon each other because this happens, this happens, because that happens, this happens. So it's all falling out at the same time. So even though our English is saying immediately after, it's after the tribulation of Jerusalem starts and after the battles are going on that the <clears throat> heavens do this and as the heavens do this, this goes on. It's an interweaving and an inner um, interaction between the two. Now, I found a new thought, and I like this thought. I haven't developed any further than the last 24 hours, but I like it, and if I come up with a problem, I'll let you know in the future. Um, immediately, um, well, let me get, I'll give you my thought in a moment. Let me say this first. 
immediately after the darkness. You know, the darkness is falling because um, war has brought such, you know, dust up. You know, we talked about the clouds from the war and all that, but then the darkening of the sun, the moon, you know, all the stars falling, all that, the darkness that's there. Immediately out of that darkness is what we have in verse 27, the flashing of the light of the Son of Man coming. How much greater is that light in the heavens when the earth is dark? The darker the night, the brighter the light. So you have that huge contrast contrast that is happening. Now, when I think on all this, and I remember the destruction of Jerusalem has been taking place. That's especially happening at this time. Right here at the end, I just read it to you in Zechariah. Then at that point is when the heavens start falling, okay? Their, their light starts dissipating. And then the Son of Man returns. Now take that all together, and here's what where my mind went. Go to Yeshua's first time on this earth. Go to his crucifixion. The crucifixion is, is right outside the city wall of Jerusalem. What happened when he was on the cross in the heavens? Darkness. Darkness fell on the face of the earth. Earth shook. Everything that we're reading about, well maybe not everything, but do you not begin to see a comparison? The darkness almost seems like the foreboding darkness before the breakthrough of the one who says I am the light of the world and we have that darkness in the heavens but then it's broken by the return of the Lord we have the darkness at his crucifixion and then we have the glory of his resurrection do you not like that comparison I like that I can see the similarity in his first coming culmination and the second coming culmination I hadn't either. It just kind of jumped out this time. It's like, wow. So Yeshua's death was bringing on the, the darkening of the sky. And here, the, the horrors, you know, the wrath of God being poured out has brought all this darkness, the consequence of sin. And yet, out of that dark comes the light, the resurrection, the power, the return of our Lord in His glory forever preview of what to come. Yes. A little taste, big taste. I like that. We'll see if I come up with any problems with it, but at this point, I like that. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. It is he who does it. I, if it stays good, the thought came from him. <laughs> I can't do anything on my own, but I love when he opens up scripture to me in a way that's like, wow. Okay, we have concluded our study on the Battle of Armageddon. Um, I'm seeing, yeah, okay, I think I've given us everything. Are there any questions or any comments before we <clears throat> thankfully leave Armageddon behind? <laughs> and remember, if you have something to say, you need to unmute yourself uh, so that we can hear it. Oh, I need myself. <laughs> unmute yourself, Roger, talk loud. Take me on your phone, too. Um, when you were talking about when the sun heats up, mm -hmm. and uh, my mom reminded me when she was a kid, at the beach, and also here in California, that she laid on the beach in the sun, and she got third-degree burn blisters even inside her mouth. Ooh. That bad over her whole body. Whoa! Mm -hmm. That's just the regular sun. That's just the regular sun. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Of course, she's fair skinned wow. still. Can, yeah. Still, sure. can you imagine when the sun's seven times hotter? Yeah. Whoa. And you can't die from it either. Yeah. Yeah, and they can't die. Yeah. No, they. They wish they couldn't, they can't. Whoa. Well, any other comments, questions? Okay. Are we ready to rock and roll? Because we're coming into the glory. <laughs> Are you ready to soar? Second coming. <laughs> I love it. Now we get, and keep that in mind, the breakthrough of the glory of the Lord. This is what we're coming into. Go with me to Acts 1.11 because we want to know what this looks like. I love getting into this part. We want to know what it looks like. Acts 1.11, very familiar, I'm sure, to most of us. Um, let me start with verse 8, verse 9. Let me start with verse 9 to give us our context, to give us our understanding. 
And he, Yeshua, after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were watching. His Talmudim were with him while they were watching, and a cloud took him up out of their sight. As they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, then behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Yeshua, this Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. This is not referring to the rapture. Again, they're, they're totally unaware of the church age, of the age of grace, of the culmination in that of rapture before the tribulation events. What's being foretold to them is the return of Messiah to set up his kingdom on earth. Because what's been promised to the Jewish nation, Messiah will come, Messiah will sit on the throne of David, Messiah will reign over this earth, that he will lift Israel up to be head nation, and all the other nations will be subservient to the, the God of Israel in the land of Israel. We have the image, Nebuchadnezzar's image, of all those Gentile world powers. We've gotten all the way down to the ten toes now. We've had the stone cut out without hands. This is Daniel 2, verses 34 and 35 and 44 and 45 for the explanation. We have the stone being shown to be virgin born, cut out without hands. It speaks to us of who Messiah is. That stone hit the image on the toes. All of the Gentile kingdoms have now come down. This is Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All of the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. The Gentile nations, their time of ruling and reigning is over. And now what has been promised to Israel to be the head nation of the world, not to be the tail. They are the ones who will be lifted up now. This is when Jewish world, world rule will be. So anybody who tells you that everything's in the hand of the Jews today, they can eat their words according to the word of God. Here is what is being referred to, though, is his return in that same way. Now, we just talked about it. We see the Son of Man coming. We see him coming in the clouds of heaven. Whether those clouds are literal, whether they are figurative and talking about peoples, I tend to think they're peoples rather than um, than fluffy white clouds. But if you want fluffy white clouds in your picture, I have no problem with that. What you're going to have your eyes focused on is the glory of the Lord coming out of that. But I do believe that, that Hebrews 12 talks to us about the cloud of witnesses. And when you study the cloud in our Hebrew study, sometime maybe I'll bring you that. It, it's very interesting, the depth that you see in it. But it's a whole lot more than just a fluffy little white puffy cloud. Anyway, um, I believe that there were those surrounding um, from heaven that were excited about the Lord's return up into heaven. And the, the Talmudim are watching this thing. Wow. And then watching the one they love be taken right out of their sight. I can see why they're still watching, and I think they're probably thinking to them, themselves, what's he doing now? Is he coming back now? Because they're still not catching that there's going to be this time delay. It's finally, as, as they move on, that they begin to understand the fullness of God's plan. Remember, they didn't have the end of the story. We do. They didn't have the book of Revelation. They didn't have all of this to explain to them. We do. We're the blessed ones. They were blessed to have that time with him. But I wouldn't have wanted to be there on the day of departure. I think that had to have been heartbreaking. I think, you know, they loved him, and he was taken up out of their sight. Anyway, these these that stood there that, that talked to them were angelic. It says two men, but I believe that they were angelic because they were dressed in white. I think that's your hint, that they looked like men, but they were angelic. Remember, the angels can take on the form of men. We see that repeatedly in Scripture. We know it in our lives and personal stories, too. And they tell them that this same Yeshua Jesus will come back the same way he was taken. He will not come back secretively. That separates it from the rapture. When the rapture occurs, the unsaved are not going to know what happened to us. We are going to suddenly disappear. They're going to wonder, and they have their excuses already out there. But it's not going to be um, a secret uh, when the Lord returns in second coming, as it is, in essence, in um, in the rapture. Sorry, lost my train of thought. Go with me to Matthew 24 and verse 30 just to see that contrast. 
because this, this is fitting with what Acts is saying, Matthew 24. Okay, tell me if this sounds like um, what they're telling is going, to, what, the, he just, what the angels just said to them. Verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. All the tribes of the earth were mourned. They will all see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Does that match with Acts 111? I believe it does. The Son of Man coming, all seeing, on the clouds of, of the sky, and we know he comes back in power and great glory at that second coming. So I think it fits. Go with me now to Revelation 1 and verse 7. Revelation 1 and verse 7. Revelation 1 verse 7 says, Behold, and if you wonder why I emphasize that, if you weren't with me when we looked at Behold for the first time, it's 30 times in the book of Revelation. Here's your first, and it basically was saying, Hey, stop, wake up, pay attention, don't miss this. It's important. Behold, he is coming. And how is he coming with clouds? Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be Amen. Does that sound like talking about the same thing? I believe so. Every eye will see him. Again, when we disappear, they're not going to know what happened to us. We're caught up in the twinkling of an eye. We're gone. They wonder. Here, all will see the Lord return. All the way down to this earth. That's when they see him. Look with me now at Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Zechariah 12 and verse 10, we read, and this is a verse I'm famous for going over and over and over. I love it. I will pour out, God speaking, I will pour out on the house of David, David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the spirit of grace. Now we've got God the Father speaking. He's pouring out the spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit, and the pleading, so that they will look at me whom they have pierced. Now we have the one of God who has been pierced. When did they see God pierced? Only time is in the form of Yeshua at, at the cross. That that is when he was pierced. Now, while he's pouring out on Jerusalem, hmm, is that where he comes back? I think we decided it was where he comes back, to the Mount of Olives. He's pouring out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem his spirit of grace. They will look at this one whom they see as pierced. When they see the Lord returning, they will see the piercings in his hands and in his feet. When they see that, they will mourn for him. Like when mourning for an only son, they will weep bitterly over him. Like the one bitterly weeping over a firstborn. Roger, Roger we're losing. They're coming and going. Everybody hear me Okay. Okay, I thought we lost connection for a second. Okay, so we have every eye seeing him here. They are wailing, they are mourning, they are in grief, they are in anguish. Why? Because they realize, wow, he was our Messiah. We missed it. This is those who, who know he is and who are turning at this moment in faith to believing he is the one. The one who came the first time is now returning the second time. When we share with our Jewish friends and they believe in the coming of the Messiah and they're beginning to see and understand the scriptures as we're revealing it to them, there's a point in time where we can say to them, what if when he comes you find out he's the one who was here before? How would you know? By his marks. How do we know this one is that one? Because he fulfilled every prophecy of what had to be true for the Messiah from the point of his birth to the way that he died to his resurrection over 300 prophecies to prove who he is yes they're finally going to be putting it together the veil of blindness removed from their eyes and that mourning that anguish that crying out is in essence oh Lord God forgive us we believe this is the ones who are coming to that saving faith how does he come Revelation 19 Describes how he comes. Remember I told you we'd come back there. Here we are. Revelation 19. We see how he comes. We're going to read verses 11 through 19. Verse 11. Saw heaven opened. And behold. Don't miss it. Behold. A white horse. 
and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Is there anyone apart from Yeshua who could be called Faithful, who could be called True, who in righteousness judges? A righteous judge always judges right and judiciously justice is given, is meted out. Does anyone else but the Lord nail that? Is there anyone else who could be called true? Who called himself true in scripture? But Yeshua himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So we know who this is. Does the Lord wage war? Wait a minute, my God's a God of peace and a God of love and we should all love each other. How could he be a God of war? Because he's waging war on the enemy of himself. That enemy being sin, that enemy personified in Satan who is trying to usurp and put himself on the throne. Can you imagine a world forever with Satan as its leader, as its ruler? I would want no part of anything that that would touch them. But here is the one. We know who it is and we know this has to be Yeshua who is coming back. The description goes on, verse 12. His eyes are a flame of fire. <coughs> that is judgment. Fire judges. On his head are many crowns. He has earned and deserves every crown he is wearing. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. We know many names of God, many names of the Lord, and I love every one of them, but yet there is one that supersedes them all. Can't wait to learn what that one is. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Did we see that in our study today? The, the blood that had been splattered on him from treading out the winepress of the wrath of God. He is clothed, uh, whoops, sorry. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name, the name that we do know him by, not the name we don't know, but his name that we know him by is called the Word of God. If you doubted me up there in the earlier verses, you can't doubt me now. This is Yeshua, Jesus, and no one other than he. Take it all the way back to Yochanan, John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. This is the Word of God coming out. We know that Word in verse 1 dwelt, um, tabernacle, verse 14, among men. We know that he has a permanent tabernacle with those who are his. We read about in Revelation 21. Enjoy that later. Here we are, back here, verse 14, the armies which are in heaven. There's armies coming with him. They're clothed in fine linen, white and clean, following him on white horses. So when he comes back to finish this battle off, which we'll read about starting with verse 15, he has those who are coming with him. How can I say that's us? Just in case if you don't know, if you don't have this in your background, go back up to verses 7 and 8 real quick. Let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to him because the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has prepared herself. Have you heard that, that the Lord is our bridegroom, that we, the church, are called his bride, the called out assembly, that, that we are called his bride? Well, the bride's prepared herself. The marriage is here. The marriage supper is going to be here. And verse 8, Jesus in. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Remember, our righteousness is his robe of righteousness. He puts his robe on us. We receive reward for our righteous acts that we do in his power, but the, the clothing comes from him. This, the, the bride who is clothed can be no one other than those that we call the church or the called out assembly. They are now the description that's given in verse 14. The armies in heaven are clothed in fine linen, white and clean, following him on white horses. Where's the church? Heaven. What's been going on on earth? Tribulation. Now, side note, only side note, just real quick, but remember Revelation is laid out in order also. Chapter 1 gives us the outline. It's the things that were, chapter 1, the things which are in John's day, chapters 2 and 3, and the things which would be hereafter, chapters 4 and following. Chapter 4, verse 1, uses that word, hereafter, tells us it's the hereafter, after 2 and 3, 2 and 3 talks to us about all the different stages of the church age, all the different 
um, called out assemblies that, that are being represented in that. Verse 1 says it is after that time. It's a picture of the rapture being called up. John was called up. Chapters 4 and 5 give him a heavenly scene. Chapter 6 begins back down here on the earth showing what happens during the tribulation. In chapter 5, you have, um, how can I say, you've got up there obviously the church because you've got John up there representing the church. Um, ah, hang on, I'll give it to you. I'm turning to Revelation 5 real quick. Um, okay. Um, let's see. I want to... I want to pick up this is where no one was worthy to open up the scroll um, okay here we go here we go verse 8 when he had taken the scroll the scroll which is the we found it was the title deed to the earth and the only one who had the right to open it is the one who owned it the Lord bought back the earth with his <coughs> shed blood that's how he redeemed us by his shed blood so verse 8, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, and we know the 24 elders are representative of us, they fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they're singing the new song, saying, Thou, Lord, you are worthy to take the scroll, to open its, to open its seals, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God, um, by your blood, out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. So this group that is praising him in verse 8 are saved by the shed blood from every tribe, from every nation of the world. That is the believers. That is the church. They're in heaven in chapter 5. The tribulation starts in chapter 6. Then we don't see the church mentioned in 6 through 19 until the tribulation ends the Lord's returning, and what was in heaven comes out of heaven with him, being the church. Where's the church during the tribulation? In heaven. That's just one little line, because I just, there's so much out there that people get so afraid, and I want you to have the comfort and the hope that all Paul intended, that the Lord intended, when he gave us those words to comfort one another with. Okay, back on track though, every eye is seeing him. Um, this description, this one who is coming back in verse 12, by the way, the crowns are the diadems. Um, these are the insignia of royalty. This is a royal crown that he is wearing. Verse 13, when it's dipped, his, his clothing is dipped in blood. The Greek has this idea that the, the cloth has been dyed or stained with that blood. Remember, we read about the amount of that in Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 4. And I already gave you the beginning of John 1. Um, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Let's go real quick. Um, just hold on if you don't want to look at it. I'll read it to you because I just want to read verse 3 there also. Um, John 1, 3, and it escapes my mind at the moment. Um, all things that came into being through him, and apart from him not even one thing came into being that has come into being. And it goes on and tells how we all, that all creation is from the Lord and that we belong to him. He is ruler of it all. He is wearing the kingly crown. He is king of kings. No other way to put it. He's king of kings seen here. Okay, back to Revelation 19. We're looking at verse 14 now. And in verse 14, no, we've done 14, I'm sorry. I think we're ready for 15. Um, the armies I've explained to you. You know what? Let me give you more verses to back up the armies, who they are, who I'm saying that they are. Go with me real quickly to 1 Thessalonians 3.13. Uh, yeah, I can, oops, I want to come back to this one. Let me take it from here. 1 Thessalonians 3. Many, many times, not just the famous chapter 4, gives us the clue of... Uh, rapture and the difference with second coming um first thessalonians 3 and verse 13 says so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our god and father at the coming of our lord jesus with all his saints so there is a time that the lord is coming in glory with his saints now when he comes in rapture for his saints 
They can't be with him yet. He's catching them up to be with him. So obviously, second coming is described by his coming with his saints. That's one key way that you can tell the difference between rapture and second coming in scripture. Is he coming for his saints or is he coming with his saints? If he's coming for, it's in rapture. If he's coming with, it's second coming. That helps you separate the two events. Okay, <clears throat> Zechariah 14 and verse 5. Zechariah 14 and verse 5. I think we read this earlier, but let's go ahead and see it in light of what we're speaking about right now. Okay, this is the battle that we know is going on. Verse um, 4 tells us it's when his feet stand on the Mount of Olives in front of Jerusalem. Verse 5, you'll flee by my valley of the mountains. You'll flee... I'm skipping down the middle of it, you, just like you fled in the days of the earthquake. The end of verse 5, Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. No one has any problem believing this is second coming because his feet touch the Mount of Olives. Well, how can his saints come with him if they're raptured at the end of the tribulation, if they're not taken up to heaven before to come out of heaven with him? And those who say, okay, but you can still have the mid-view. Well, remember, in the middle of the tribulation, God tells them if they, when they see, not if, but when they see the abomination set up in the temple to be worshipped, to flee, to get out, and to hide. That's um, um, Matthew 24, starting with verse 15. Okay, Isaiah 26, 20 correlates with that, and it says... Come, my people, hide yourselves for a little while until my indignation has passed. Indignation is another word for wrath. When he's saying that he's going to be pouring out his wrath all the more, he tells his people, his people, that means the people who are tuned in to the Lord, who are believing in the Lord, he tells them, hide yourself for just a little while till this is over. We see them told, if you're living in Jerusalem, Flee. Get out and go. We believe that it's down to Petra. Okay, that's what we talked about. Now, we know that happens at the midpoint of the tribulation because we know that from the timing when that abomination is set in the temple. It's midpoint. We know at the midpoint, the worst of the wrath of God is poured out. All the tribulation is wrath, but the fullness of its wrath is poured out without any holdback from the mid on. That's why some people say, oh, well, that's the part we escape. Okay, if you are going to escape that wrath that's coming, then why is he telling his people to hide? If he's coming in rapture at that midpoint, why does he not say, look up, your redemption draws nigh? Why does he not say, fear not, stand still, I will gather you up to be with me? He doesn't. He tells, come my people hide yourself for a little while. He tells them if you're in Jerusalem, go as fast as you can. Don't even go back in your house to pack a bag. Get out of town. Get out now before you can't get out. I don't see any way you can have a mid-tribulation rapture when God's telling him go hide. Okay? So, he's coming back with his saints. They have to have been with him from the start of the tribulation. Remember Revelation 3.10 tells us it comes on the earth dwellers. Are we earth dwellers? Oh, you say we are because we live on this earth? Well, hello. <laughs> Where's our citizenship? Where's our home? We are citizens of heaven. We are not earth dwellers. The earth dwellers used in scripture are those who do not believe in their God. We are citizens of heaven. Revelation 3.10 says this coming on the face of the whole earth like nothing has ever been. There's several layers in that verse alone that tell us again and again and again. We are not in that number. We do not go into the tribulation. We do not come out of the tribulation. We are kept from the tribulation. Hallelujah. Now is a blessed hope. And how could it be imminent if we knew we had to go through the first three and a half years, then it can't be imminent. Why could Paul look for it in his day? And he looked for the coming of the Lord. He thought he was going to be caught up in it. 
1 Thessalonians 4 says, we who are alive and remain will be caught up. Paul put himself into that. He didn't say those who are alive in that day because I know it's not now. Paul thought it could happen in his day. We who are alive will be caught up. We will be caught up to be with the Lord before the tribulation begins. The only view that has an imminent rapture view is pre-trib rapture. Mid, you know you've got three and a half years from the start to that middle point. It's easy to identify the start because the man of sin is revealed. We will not know who he is. Hallelujah. I don't need to know evil on the face of this earth by name. I want out of here, folks. I lost my train of thought. I sidetracked myself. It's easy to know the start of the tribulation. When they see those things start, the false peace set up, not the precursor which we see now, the trying to get the, the Arabs and the Jews to make peace, but the real, where there really is a false peace, where there really is a start to build your temple and do this and do that. And, you know, you, you, the difference, it will be a real event that can be seen. They'll know that's the start of the tribulation. If they knew that, they would know, okay, three and a half years, we got to endure that before the Lord comes. And they'd know to prepare themselves for the three and a half years. It just doesn't fit. The only view that could be an imminent rapture is a view that cannot, that is not waiting now for any specific sign. We're waiting for the sounds. We hear him blow the shofar. We hear the voice out of heaven. We hear like John heard in chapter 4, verse 1, a picture of the rapture. Come up here and boom. We're caught up. Then the tribulation takes place, and we come back with him. It just all fits together. I cannot see any argument that can come against that. Those who use verses that say, what about this and what about that? Check where their verses come from. Almost without fail, their verses will come from Scripture that's given to Israel. Israel goes into the tribulation. Israel comes out of the tribulation. Look for where the verses are coming from. Know who your scriptures are to. All of the word of God is for us. We learn from Bereshit, verse 1, to Revelation 22. There's nothing in the word of God that is not there for us. But it is all the word to us? No, it's not all to us. What Shaol Paul wrote to the believing called out assembly had no value to those who lived prior to it, who lived under law. The ones that were under law, what's given to them by law, had no value to Adam and Eve in the garden, to Enoch, and to those who were before the law was given. We see that scripture was written to different people. It shows the different ways that God works with people throughout the whole course of time. But it's not all directly to us. There are certain scriptures that will be meaningful only during the tribulation time. We don't worry today about the mark of the beast. We know that we see the ability of that coming, but there is no one threatening that to us. There is no one that we would be praying for for their salvation right now that can take that mark that God says, don't even pray for them now. They're lost. It, they sealed their fate because they pledged their allegiance to, to Satan, to uh, the one behind the Antichrist. We don't worry about that today. I'm not praying for the unsaved that I'm praying for, and I'm not going to call them out by name because I'm on video. But their names are popping in my mind right now. Those who I'm praying will come to saving faith. I'm not praying for any one of them. Oh, Lord, don't let them take the mark of the beast. That's not fitting to us today. I am praying, don't let them miss the rapture. Let them get saved before and go with us because I don't want them to have to endure the tribulation. But thankfully, I'd rather have them go through the tribulation and get saved in it and have heaven on the other end, have an eternity with God than to never. And thankfully, anyone can get saved during the tribulation. We see it start with 144,000 that are raised up to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But do you see the magnanimous plan of God? And he works it out perfectly. And he has a plan that is in effect. That's why I say even something like COVID is part of God's plan because he uses the good, he uses the bad. He raises up bad leaders and he brings them down. He is working in great and mighty ways. And bless the Lord, one church in particular, again, I'm leaving names out on purpose, but one church in particular that has had their food ministry 
boom, because of the great need. And by the way, it's not the church I'm speaking of, but I do have a church in my area that has let me know as uh, recent as last night. If you know people in need of food, they have a surplus to help right now. They're trying to get it into the hands of those in need. I'll forget to tell you that at the end of class. So if you know someone in need, get in touch with me. I'll put them together with, with a local church that has an ability to help right now. It's not who I'm talking about, but this church who has seen their food ministry explode because of COVID has been keeping track of those that they have been witnessing to in their food lines and those they have led to the Lord, and they crossed the number 10,000. Hallelujah. That makes me want to cry. That's my God in the middle of COVID. And there'll be those who will say, oh, well, they're not real. You know, they're just saying that to get the food. Only God knows the heart and only God can judge. But if even one out of that 10,000 meant it, it's worth it for that one. It's worth it for one. The Lord would have died for one. If I was the only one on the face of this earth and I found a way to sin, he would have died for me. What? <sighs> Hallelujah. So don't throw in the towel and get discouraged and have a fit and... Have that complaining mouth because we know how God wants a mouth that is praising him. How do you praise him for COVID? I say, Lord, praise you that people in need turn to the church who had the gospel message, who gave it out with the food, fed them physically, and it met their spiritual need, and they got a spiritual meal that will last forever. They won't ever hunger again. Praise the Lord. That's my God in the midst of COVID. You get that one for free. i got to get back on track. i got to finish this off today. I won't get to the end, but I want to finish the end of Revelation 19. Um, I just hope I, I'm holding out encouragement to you. We all need it. Do I fight getting discouraged? Sure I do. But you know how I get encouraged? I get my eyes back on my Lord. I look at his wonderful plan, and then he shares with me. See what I'm doing, Rochelle? See what I'm doing here? See what I'm doing there? It's not all lost, folks. But again, I'd rather people hurt today and find the Lord than have their way paved to hell with all the glories that this world has because there's nothing that will compare to an eternity without our Lord. Nothing. Nothing. Got to get the word out, people. Got to get the word out. Did I do where I'm at? Where am I at? I am in Zechariah 14. Did I read us verse 5? Yes, I did, that he's coming with his holy ones. Colossians 3, 4. I want you to see that, that we've got it all the way through Scripture. We've got, you know, a number of, um, of uh, witnesses. It's, we always build our case on the Word of God. Colossians 3, 4. When Messiah, when Christ, in your Scripture, when Messiah, who is our life? Is he not? When he is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. How are we revealed with him in glory? Well, we read it in Revelation 19 when he's coming back in all his glory to rule and to reign, to show this world who he is. He's not coming as suffering servant, but he is coming as reigning king of kings and lord of lords. It's saying that we will be revealed with him in glory. We've got to be with him to be revealed with him. We've got to have our robe of righteousness to be part of his glory. We're part of his booty. We're part of, look what I want. Look at the souls that I have with me. And now let me take you to Jude on the way back to Revelation. I think we're going back there anyway. Jude, Jude in Hebrew, um, one chapter long. Verse 14, verse 15 that we want to look at. One mighty packed little book. <laughs> it was also, verse 14, it was also about these people that Enoch, Hanok, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied saying, Behold, the Lord has come with many thousands of his holy ones. How did Enoch know that? Were there thousands of people on the face of the earth in Enoch's day? If there were, were there thousands that were saved? I kind of tend to think the number wasn't that big, but even if it was, he saw, he knew that the Lord was going to come back with thousands of his holy ones, thousands who had been saved, thousands who had been glorified in him. Why is he coming back? Could this be when he's coming to Gadda? No, it's talking about his coming with them. 
Verse 15, why he's coming back? To execute judgment upon all, to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I love this verse. Did you catch what we just read? If that isn't a, a, a anathema against this earth and, and the mouths that are so ungodly that are continuing <clears throat> on, we ourselves say, Lord, how long can you tolerate this sin? How long can they, do, can they take your name and smear it and you not do something? Do you not grieve in your spirit when you hear his name used in vain? That's about one of the worst things I can hear. I, I oh. And here he's coming to execute judgment against them. The ungodly, who are ungodly in their deeds, who are ungodly in their ways, who have spoken harsh things as ungodly sinners against my <coughs> God, against my Lord, against the one I love. He's coming, he's going to finally execute judgment. And I say, hallelujah, it's long overdue, Lord. Bring it on. Remember how those angels told him, put in the sickle. I get it because I want to see my Lord exonerated. I want to see him receive honor that's due his holy name. I want to see thousands falling at his feet, crying out praises, hosannas, thanking him. I want to see that glory. And I want to see it on this earth that has so disgraced the name of my Lord. They took him the first time, and in their zest, they cried out, crucify him. Well, now, as they're coming against him, gnawing their teeth in their blasphemies and their, their anguish against him, and still not turning to him now, judgment is going to come, righteous judgment. Not unfair, not undue, not unjust, but righteous. They are going to reap what they have sown. They are going to be stopped. Their mouths are going to be silenced and it is going to be over and he is going to reign supreme. Hallelujah. How do I say it? Bigger, better, louder, and stronger? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Help me here. <laughs> I'm going Pentecostal on you. Where's Eric? <laughs> Where's Eric? Hallelujah. <laughs> this is victory. This is so long overdue. If your heart grieves at the sin of this world, it's going to rejoice at the coming and notice that we are coming with him. Enoch knew them. All the way back, seven generations from Adam. How many generations are we now? Thousands. All I know is the Lord says that his word is true for a thousand generations. And it doesn't mean count to a thousand and stop. It means infinite. All that I know is everything God has planned, he will carry out. Enoch knew it. Enoch saw it. He saw all these people coming with the Lord to execute judgment. We know that's what he does on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, the city that he has chosen to put his name on. That makes it a holy city. It's not holy now. It's a disgrace to him now. And I'm saddened to say my own people are blasphemous against him now. And I don't mean the whole, but as a whole. But thankfully, the day is coming. Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is where we're going to end for today. We will pick up, um, yeah, I really can't do it. We'll pick up with verse 15 here still, the executing of the justice. We'll see how he does it. You know what? It only take one more minute. I know I'm way overdue, but let me give it to you because it just finishes off this thought with Revelation 19. So let me take you real fast. It's saying that he's coming back, and here's what he's going to be doing, Psalm 2. I can do this real fast, trust me. Psalm 2, 8, 9. Ask of me, and I will certainly give the nations as your inheritance. God speaking to Yeshua at the end, and the ends of the earth as your possession. So God is saying, I'm going to give it all to you. Remember, he said, sit here till I make your enemies your footstool. He is going to give the nations as an inheritance to Yeshua. And verse 9, Yeshua will break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them with earthenware. That means that he is going to rule and reign strongly. He is going to stop the enemy, break them, stop them with the sword that comes out of his mouth. And then when he sets up his kingdom to rule from here on earth, he will rule with a rod of iron. If you rule with a rod of iron, no one steps out of line. It's, it's fair, it's just, but it's, it's harsh. It is not, 
oh, well, we'll just slap the wrist. We'll just, you know, we'll wink at it this time. We'll give you another chance. No, it's judgment will be meted out quickly and, and harshly, but fairly. And when others see that, they're going to know, oh, I'm not going to get out of line. I saw what happened to Joe Blow. So this is how the Lord will rule and reign. I think we already talked about it in Revelation 14. Um, stay with me in Psalm. Let me give you Psalm 110. Then we'll go back to Revelation in closing. Psalm 110, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 6. 1 and 2 says, the Lord says to my Lord, this is Adonai saying, or this is Jehovah saying to Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. I've been quoting it all the way through. Here it is, Psalm 110 and verse 1. It is the Lord God saying to Yeshua, um, it's being represented by David realizing that there is a Lord greater than he. He is a little Lord sitting on the throne. There is the greater Lord. Anyway, verse 2, the Lord will stretch out your strong scepter from Zion, from Zion, saying rule in the midst of your enemies. Here he comes back to rule in the midst of his enemies. That's verse 2. Drop down to verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his hand. That's what we just studied all the way through the culmination of the Battle of Armageddon. It's him shattering the chief men, filling the, the earth with the corpses, judging the nations, drinking their blood, so to speak. And then he lifts up his hand. Remember, he comes back crowned with the royal crown. That's Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2, 5 and 6 that I read. Now in closing, Revelation 14, where we have been today, Revelation 14. That's why I wanted to include it so quickly. You're going to put down in your note-taking verses 14 through 20. We won't read it all because we have. Verse 14 tells you that it, there's one sitting on the, the cloud like the Son of Man. He puts in his sickle. He, he, the sickle, verse 16, is reaped over the earth. Um, then others say, come and put in your sharp sickle, verse 18, 18 again. Gather the clusters from the vine of the earth. Her grapes are ripe. And then verse um, well, 19, still he threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Verse 20 tells you when the winepress was trampled, how much the blood came out. That's what we're seeing here is that he's putting an end. He's putting a stop. It is a bloody war that ends it. But then he sets up his kingdom as glory. Remember when we started in uh, Revelation 12 to study the woman? We studied the beat. Well, we studied the woman, the dragon. Um, and others from chapter 12. Well, chapter 12 and verse 5 is the only verse that, that we're looking at. She, Israel, gave birth to a son, a male, who is going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That's what we're seeing now. The son that Israel gave birth to we know is the Messiah. We know that her child, the rest of verse 5, was caught up to God in his throne. Where is he now? Caught up to God in his throne, waiting for Psalm 110. One. Wait till I make all your enemies your footstool. So this one, who Israel gave birth to, who is the son that was given, the child was born, but the son was given, this one, who is now at the right hand of God, sitting on the throne, waiting until the enemies are made footstool, will come back. Why? To rule all the nations with that rod of iron. To rule fair, to rule just, but to rule sharp, rule sharp and true. This is the ruling God. This is his second coming. When we start up next week, we will start up with Zechariah 14, if you want to read it ahead. We'll talk a little bit more about Matthew. We'll see who goes into the kingdom, because we're going to see that we're coming to the kingdom. Um, in fact, that's what a second coming goes right into the kingdom. So next time we will look at the rest of his second coming. Well, um, other scriptures that, that talk about it, we've already uh, looked at some, but we'll look a little bit more. Uh, if you want to read ahead, read, read, I'd start with verse 27 of Matthew 24 and go through 41. Um, read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10 if you want, because at the time of the second coming, there is a time of judgment. From the judgment, then we go into the millennium. Who goes into the millennium? How does it get started? Why is the end different from the beginning? 
These are the questions we'll answer next time because we should quickly finish off second coming and then move right into the millennium. Then when we get done with the millennium, the question was asked, what started this whole study is, what comes after that, Rochelle? <laughs> we'll see what the scriptures have to say. So, we have a little more to come, a little more to go, I mean, but we are coming to the very end of what we know revealed in scripture. Um, I am going to close in prayer in just a moment, but... I'm going to ask you, stay tuned. Um, those of you on the YouTube sites and all that won't need it because we're going to be talking about what we're going to do next week, what we're going to do in relation to Hanukkah. Um, I'll just say on Bitly, we may, uh, the Bitly site, the bit.ly site, with, there may be a little break before the next lesson comes up, but we'll try to put something up and let you know, okay? So because it's so late, let me close in a word of prayer, but any who can stay, Stay a minute longer so we can discuss Hanukkah and our plans and, and where we go from here, okay? I'm so sorry. I was trying to be really good. I even wanted to end at 3.30 today, but all of a sudden I was caught up in it and I didn't even watch the clock. So, Lord, thank you. You've given us your word and you will fulfill every dotted I and every cross T. You will come back. Thank you that you will catch us up first to escape the coming atrocities of the wrath of your judgment that you have promised us to be with you during that time to come back ready to rule and reign with you in your second coming. Thank you. You keep your word to Israel. You keep your promises. You will fulfill all that has been said. We know it and we, we are secure in your love and in your faithfulness. We praise you. We just yearn for it, Lord. We just want all of heaven to be brought down to earth so that all of earth is glorifying you also. And we thank you that day is coming. We will see that day. Thank you, Lord, for your magnanimous plan that included me. And thank you it included those I love. In your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. What a note to end on. Whew. Okay. <clears throat> Stay down to earth for just a moment. Open their mics for them, please, Roger, or unmute yourselves. I have